Every outing we take carries a small element of risk. But when Kani Ong returned to her home country to support a family illness, she had no idea that a simple dinner at a shopping mall would end in her being at the mercy of a violent and depraved killer. The events that followed shook the nation of Malaysia to its very core, and outraged the public so much that it sparked pivotal changes to its laws. But what precisely happened to Kani Ong? What evil found her at a shopping mall? And what happened next? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a rather infamous case from Malaysia that happened in the year 2003. It feels like I say this all too often, but this case is so senseless and is so difficult to comprehend, and the killer's own version of events is honestly mind-blowing. By the way, welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And apologies if I seem a little lethargic in this one, folks. It's currently 30 degrees Celsius in here, or 86 Fahrenheit. Honestly, I am so warm. Before we begin today, I just wanted to take one moment to talk about our sponsor, and that is AG1. Now, I was using AG1 months before they reached out to me, which is quite awesome, by the way. But AG1 has done a phenomenal job at managing my focus, energy, and stress levels. For those of you who haven't heard of AG1, it's a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced nutrients that aid your brain, gut, and immune system. It is packed with all of the good stuff that supports your body. Rhodolia, magnesium, and B vitamins support sustained energy, whereas prebiotics, probiotics, and plant-based enzymes help support your digestion. And your daily dose of vitamin C, zinc, and more supports your immune health. All of these small benefits add up together, and its taste is pretty damn good too. AG1 has become a key part of my morning ritual, even before my first cup of coffee. It has helped me feel more energized and reassured that I'm getting a full spectrum of vitamins and minerals that help support my immune system. AG1 sources the best and highest quality ingredients it can find, which include 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. I find I'm able to concentrate more, feel less stressed, and be more alert. And ever since taking AG1, I feel less bloated too, which was a nicely unexpected benefit. It is honestly one of the few things I'd consider as part of my secret formula. Running a YouTube channel and all of the hours behind it is tough, and this helps me keep on top of the game. If you're ready to give AG1 a try, then head over to drinkag1.com slash coffeehousecrime or click the link in the description below. To add to that, you'll also get a one year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs. That's drinkag1.com slash coffeehousecrime. Thank you, AG1, for sponsoring today's video. Thank you to you folks for supporting us content creators. And now let's get straight back to today's case. Anyway, and now with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Kani Ong. Salamat pagi, folks. Today, we're traveling to another new country on the coffeehouse crime map. Tucked underneath the beautiful countries of Thailand and Vietnam, we find the dual island nation of Malaysia. Comprised of 13 states that are split across two islands, the country has a population of just over 32 million residents, making this place one of the largest nations in the region. Malaysia is well known for its multicultural society, its exotic cuisine, and, of course, its many tropical rainforests which can be found scattered throughout the landscape. Home to Malayan tigers, Asian elephants, and several species of primates, it's also a very important hub for biodiversity in Southeast Asia. But while this country is beautiful and very diverse, it does also have its own flaws. Capital punishment is still widely used by the legal system for the worst of crimes. But saying that, there are some rather strange quirks to it too. In 1983, Malaysia recognized drug smuggling as one of the nation's top challenges. And with this in mind, they mandated the death penalty for all forms of drug smuggling. Anyway, there are a total of 11 types of crime that mandate the death penalty, and of course, one of those includes murder. But before we get ahead of ourselves here, we're focusing on one very important woman, that being 28-year-old Kani Ong Lei Kian. And get ready, by the way, because behind her story, we're going on an international journey. Born on July the 18th, 1974, to her mother Pearly Visvanavan and father Ong Bi Jang, she was the middle child of three sisters and grew up in a loving family home found in the small city of Ipo, which can be located towards the north of the Malaysian peninsula. As with many other families in the country, Kani's family were rather multicultural. 
Her mother was of Chinese Indian descent, where her father was from Singapore. While growing up, she would prove herself to be an intelligent and hardworking student, achieving high grades throughout her education. She was popular, had many friends, and was an ambitious young woman. She also had dreams of studying abroad, which eventually she would certainly achieve. Studying in the tropical paradise of Hawaii, she earned herself a degree in economics. This decision was positively supported by her many friends and family, and after graduating in the 90s, she travelled even further afield to find work in the bustling city of Los Angeles. Now, our adventurous, brave, and successful young woman would eventually find work at a marketing company, which evidently helped her make a decent living in the city, and it's here, in this moment of her life that she found her future husband, Brandon Ong. Brandon's parents were both Chinese-born, but had moved to LA from Singapore around 20 years earlier, meaning that he had spent most of his life as an American citizen. Now, this suited the pair perfectly, as, moving through her young adult years, Kani found that she had no intention of moving back to Malaysia. The pair were quick to hit it off, eventually marrying in 2001, before moving to San Diego to settle in their new married life. And although they didn't have children just quite yet, they would become very proud cat parents instead. Of course, I have no idea what that feels like. Everything seemed to be going rather well for Canny and Brandon. They were just beginning their happy and new journey in life together. However, for Canny, this was sadly all about to change, as in early 2003, her father, who still lived in Malaysia, was unfortunately diagnosed with kidney cancer. The diagnosis left Kani and her family in despair, but she was determined to help them the best way she could, so from across the Atlantic Ocean, she kept a watchful eye on her father. It was eventually decided that her father needed surgery for his condition, and so with Kani wanting to be there, she booked a flight to head on back to Malaysia. And so on June the 1st, 2003, she left her husband to look after the cats. Now fortunately, her father's surgery was a success, and he was now on a slow but steady road to recovery. Following the good news, Kani felt comfortable enough to return to the United States, and so, booking a flight for June the 14th, 2003, she decided to go out for dinner one last time with her family the night prior at a shopping centre. Dining at Monty's restaurant and wine bar, located in the Bangsa shopping centre in Kuala Lumpur, they tucked in to a lavish dinner of steak and fried crab. A photo from that night shows a united family happily dining together, Kani and her infectious smile beaming out from amongst them. Realising that her mother had grown tired from the dinner, Kani offered to drive her back home before returning to the gathering, and along with her sister, the three women descended back to the underground car park. However, after arriving at the pay machine, Kani realised that she had left her ticket in the car, and so, telling her relatives to wait by the machine, she dashed back to the vehicle to retrieve it. This should have taken a mere minute or two. However, after 20 minutes had passed, her mother and sister began to worry. They tried to reach her on her mobile phone, and although the first call rang through to voicemail, the second one cut straight to it, thus indicating that the phone had been turned off between calls. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. The sudden change in events was very worrying, and after making their way down to where the car was parked, which was a purple Proton Tiara, they realised that it was now nowhere to be found. It's at this moment that both confusion and a slight panic began to set in, and the two worried relatives returned to the rest of the family to deliver the news. Together, the family began their unplanned search for Kani. The young woman seemed to have just suddenly vanished. After tracking down the car park security team, they pleaded with them to review all surveillance footage which may contain visuals. Together, the family and security officers traced her last recorded movements, and what they saw terrified them beyond all measure. Although Kani was captured walking to her car, she wasn't aware that she was being stalked by a strange and recognisable figure. The two eventually disappear out of view, before her purple proton tiara is seen driving around the car park, before passing through the barriers at the exit. Located within the car, an unknown individual could be seen in the driver's seat, and next to him was a frightened looking woman who could only be assumed to be Kani. To everyone's fear, it looked like she had just been abducted by a stranger. 
One hour after her disappearance, Kenny's abduction was reported to the police, and the young woman was officially classed as missing. And it would soon transpire that the car park surveillance footage was not the last time that she would be seen by law enforcement. Just prior to midnight, two undercover police officers spotted a suspiciously parked car that fit the Proton's description. They decided to approach the vehicle, and as they did, two figures became visible. To their surprise, Kenny Ong was in the car and also appeared to be alive and well, and by her side was this random man who had abducted her. The officer ordered the pair of them to prove their identity, in which both adults complied, and the man that she was with was formally identified as 27-year-old Ahmad Najib Harris. While checking their IDs, and while Ahmad was distracted, Kenny desperately tried to get the officer's attention by subtly shaking her hands. Now, at the time, the officer had no idea what she was trying to do, but in hindsight he should have known better because something was very, very wrong here. As soon as Ahmad realized what Kenny was doing, he slammed his foot on the accelerator, and the two of them disappeared into the night, leaving the officer with both of their IDs in his hand. Thinking fast, the officer pulled out his gun and fired at the vehicle's tires, flattening one of them in the process. But sadly, this was not enough to stop it, and Kenny Ong slipped into the night. Another report of the pair would come just one hour later, when a woman and her brother were approached by a stranger asking for a carjack. Peering over at the car, just 20 feet away, she noticed a worried looking woman sitting in the front seat. Kenny was, once again, frantically gesturing for help with her hands. All in the meanwhile, Ahmad was busy changing the front tire. By instinct, the woman felt that something was terribly wrong. She decided to take the number plate of the purple car and then eventually pass it on to the police. Predictably, Ahmad was in no mood to hang around, and after realising it was going to take too long, he gave up on the tyre, got back in the car, and then fled again with Canny. And after the woman reported this encounter to the police, this sighting would be the last time that anyone saw Canny Ong alive. Days passed without any sign of Kani. Everyone knew that this wasn't good news, and her grief-stricken family had the awful duty of telling her husband, Brandon, the man himself desperately waiting for an update thousands of miles away. The tension left behind in her silence raged on for a short while. However, on day three, a shocking and gruesome discovery was uncovered. On June the 17th, construction workers could smell something awful coming from the side of the road. Curiosity got the better of them, and after following their noses, they eventually tracked the smell to a small manhole cover. Thinking that some kind of animal may have crawled inside and died, they wanted to take a closer look. At the bottom of the manhole, and beneath a couple cement-filled tyres, they discovered the remains of a small female human body, burnt almost beyond recognition. Responding to the scene immediately, officers could tell that she had been bound with cloth around her neck, with her arms tied in across her chest. Already knowing of Kani Ong's disappearance, police officers contacted the missing woman's family to see if they could help identify the body. Halfway across the world, Brendan waited in agony to hear the news. Sadly, a mixture of forensics and positive identification by the family would confirm their worst fear imaginable. Autopsy reports revealed that Kani Yong had been stabbed twice in the stomach, before eventually being strangled. Her abandoned proton tiara was discovered later that day, with one tyre still deflated. To add to this, a large blood stain was discovered on the back seat. This was later tested and confirmed to belong to Kani. Now, obviously, this man clearly was stupid, because despite leaving his ID with the officer, he just returned back home and acted as if nothing had happened. Using his ID card, officers found him the very next day back at home, which he shared with his girlfriend. Which is quite terrifying when you think about it, because very little did she know that the very night prior, he had murdered and assaulted another woman. Forensic analysis found Ahmad's DNA in the car, at the scene that her body was found, and tragically, inside Kani's body too and Kani's DNA was found all over his clothes. With these results negating any sort of deniability, Ahmad had no choice but to confess, in hoping that he may be spared the death penalty. Following his confession and testimonies made by other people, investigators were able to build a solid recount of the night's events. After trying to change his tyre, Ahmad drove to a secluded area beneath an abandoned bridge. While here, he threatened Kani at knife point and told her to get in the back seat. And between the hours of 1 and 5am, she was 
tragically repeatedly assaulted. When Kani eventually fought back, he stabbed her twice in the stomach, resulting in the back seat being covered in her own blood. She was then bound, strangled, and then dumped into a nearby manhole, where Ahmad then cruelly covered her up with two tires. He then abandoned the car in the nearby warehouse before hitching a taxi back home, and if that wasn't enough, he returned with two petrol canisters the next day, poured both of them down the manhole, and then set it alight. An interesting side note, by the way, but using a fire to conceal a murder seems to be a very common misconception. Many murderers don't realise that full cremation can only occur between 1000 and 3000 degrees Celsius, or for you Americans, 1800 and 5500 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, obviously, this this isn't something you'd get from a typical petrol fire, and all the evidence you were trying to conceal would actually still remain. And so, after three days of investigation and following an obvious trail of evidence, Ahmad Najib was officially arrested and charged with the kidnap, assault, and murder of Kani Yong. As you can probably imagine, this case sent shockwaves throughout Malaysia. Due to their very harsh punishment, murder cases are actually quite rare in this country, but the sheer brutality and disrespect committed in this one was enough to anger the entire nation. Now, ultimately, the road to justice was going to be both long and difficult, but it didn't actually take long to kick off. With the general public expressing their sincere appetite for prosecution, his trial began only three months later, which was September the 15th, 2003. In a strange twist of fate, it would take multiple years before a verdict would finally be reached. During his trial, Ahmad portrayed himself as a compassionate man who was merely trying to look out for Kani. He claimed that the entire situation was simply a mistaken identity, and that the real target was actually a previous employer. According to him, after looking at her ID, and when he realised that Kani wasn't actually the woman who he thought she was, they both laughed and even joked about the mistake. He then allegedly tried to befriend her, eventually suggesting they have sex. Ahmad tried to say that, because she didn't refuse, he thought it was consensual. He would also claim that he was forced to stab her through self-defence, and that he had even tried to help her by then asking her not to move. He then apparently offered to take her to the hospital, but then changed his mind because he didn't have the money to pay for treatment. When it became obvious that she was going to die, he then offered her to heaven, before strangling her and then dumping her body. Now, obviously, his story was a terrible fabrication. There was no sort of compassion or consent whatsoever, and all of the evidence available unequivocally confirmed his violence actions. During his trial, it was revealed that this wasn't his first time either and Ahmad had actually assaulted four other women on four separate occasions. Unfortunately though, due to the shame and stigma behind his actions, all four decided not to testify against him, as they would have to be publicly named. As with most cases involving homicide, Ahmad had to be professionally evaluated by psychologists to see if he was sane and could be held accountable for his actions. And given the penalty is much more severe in a country like Malaysia, an additional sense of criticality had to be put on this evaluation. However, despite this, Ahmad was still found to be completely sound of mind, and was therefore accountable for all of his actions. Despite all of the evidence stacked against him and his own written confession, Ahmad would still plead not guilty to the murder and assault of Kani Yong, and whether they liked it or not, his defence lawyers would aggressively rally behind their client. His defence team pulled any reason or excuse they could think of to try to reduce, excuse, or even justify Ahmad's actions. And if I could tell you every dumb excuse they came up with, I think this video would probably go on for hours. Now, one of the most ridiculous of these arguments included blaming Kani's actions and motives. The defence questioned why she had not taken the multiple opportunities she had to run away from Ahmad when she seemed to have plenty of opportunity to do so. Two of those most pertinent questions were, why didn't she try to leave the car when officers asked them for ID? And why did she not take the opportunity to run away while Ahmad was busy trying to change a tyre? They argued that this wasn't because Kani had been abducted, but rather that she was somewhat compliant with Ahmad, and that she had even consented to the arrangement and actions that occurred that night. The defence would further insult this case by suggesting that the cloth around her neck was part of some sort of sexual fantasy gone wrong, and that perhaps her death could have been accidental as a result. However, this theory was very quickly brushed away. It became evident that the cloth had been tied extremely tightly around her neck. This could be proved because 
because the area of her neck beneath the cloth was the only part of her body that remained uncharred by the fire. Now, this story still failed to explain how or why she had been stabbed, so I guess Ahmad's defence team conveniently forgot about that one. In the end, his defence simply didn't hold up, and on February the 23rd, after a final trial at the Shah Alam High Court, Ahmad Najib was found guilty of the assault and murder of Kani Yong. And let me tell you, his sentencing would not go down lightly. For the assault of his victim, Ahmad was given the maximum punishment available, resulting in a sentence of 20 years behind bars. As for the murder charge, he was given the death penalty, and just to rub salt to the wound, he was also sentenced to 10 lashes of the cane. The rather savage sentence came as a relief for Kani's friends and family. A terribly brutal killer had been brought to justice with a terribly brutal sentence. And although nothing could bring Kani back, in their minds, justice had been served in the closest way possible. Although Ahmad initially told reporters that he accepted the verdict, he would later change his mind in 2007, and again in 2009 when he appealed his own conviction. Unsurprisingly, both of these appeals were ultimately denied. I find it woeful that, of all people, a murderer who selfishly took the life of another human would actually feel scared and entitled enough to try and get their own back. It just goes to show, really, how much of a spineless coward this man really was. Ahmad's efforts would not stop there, however. He appealed for mercy from the Sultan of Salangor, who is the head of state and Islamic religion. But this appeal was once again rejected, meaning that Ahmad was destined to be at the gallows. And finally, on September the 23rd, 2016, more than 13 years after the murder of Kaniyong, the now 40-year-old Ahmad Najib bin Aris met his end. He was executed by hanging in Kajang prison at 6am that morning. This development was a relief for Kaniyong's family and loved ones, knowing that their killer had now finally been brought to justice. Although Ahmad's execution may have felt cathartic to Kani's family, it sadly doesn't do anything to bring her back. She was a bright, independent woman who had big dreams, and even bigger achievements. Kani was taken from her family in the moment she was doing her very best to support them, travelling across an ocean to be there, and driving her mother back home at the end of a long day. Her family had no idea that, that evening, they were not saying goodbye before she flew back to the US, but saying goodbye forever. This case is one that gripped Malaysia for very obvious reasons. I mean, sheer brutality aside, everyone was so shocked to see this happen in the middle of a busy shopping centre. Following this case, and in an effort to provide safety, many Malaysian car parks started offering women's only parking spots. Many shopping centres would also increase their security by hiring more security guards and installing extra surveillance cameras. Sadly, hindsight can be 2020, and it often takes tragic cases like these to spur motivation and change. So, although Kani may be lost to the world, her death has actually catalyzed the safety of millions of women across Malaysia. And although it's been more than 20 years since her passing, I'm sure that her family and friends still think of her every single day. So anyway folks, I think I'm going to wrap this one up here today. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or insightful, please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. By the way, it now looks like Malaysia is trying to abolish the death penalty which is quite interesting actually. It is quite a hard topic to debate, and if honest, I don't know what I think about the death penalty, but I'd love to hear what you think in the comments section down below. Thank you again to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. If you'd like to try AG1, then head on over to drinkag1.com slash coffeehousecrime. If you'd like to get early access to my videos, additional videos, and much, much more, then please check out my Patreon. And if you'd like to see more information on my cases, follow my adventures, or just see more pictures of Nero, then please check out my social media profiles. Anyway, folks, that is it for me today, but as always, I'm back again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.